What's going on, Coach Luca here, and I'm gonna break down today nutrition that works for good. Now, you know, the reason we, essentially I wanted to put this presentation together is to kind of create a roadmap and a guideline to help you transform the way that you eat that's gonna get your results, once again, for good, right? One of the things that, you know, uh, I would say habit change, behavior changes, kind of like this living organism. It's not the same for anybody. Everybody has a different preferences, different lifestyle, different jobs, work, all those things in that nature. So putting things into a cookie cutter, you know, bucket like, oh, just do step one, two, three, four, five, and everything will be great. Not realistic. If that was the case, obviously we wouldn't be where we are currently in the U.S. with uh, the obesity rates, the, you know, I say cardiovascular health declining, obesity rates going up, right? And so our mission is to help you transform the way that you eat. And yet at the same time for it not to be you know, what this is not is like, hey, do this 28-day detox plan, you know, go super hardcore, make massive changes, uh, you know, drastically and fast, which has been proven not to work, right? So, uh, you know, even though there's more information than ever, even though there's more diets on the market, there's more, you know, plans that promise this, that, and the other, uh, you know, as a country and for most people, it's not working, right? So, actually, matter of fact, you know, this will be a great segue to lead into what we want to try to prevent and what we see going on a lot, right? So when you think about fat loss, I mean, there has to be some type of dietary restriction, meaning like you, you, there's no way to drop weight or, and or fat without dropping calories, without a restriction, right? So this is what usually happens, right? Typically, you get, a person will go on a diet. They'll restrict energy intake. Um, you know, and some of the things that we see a lot of is like these massive restrictions. So a person that's I'm just gonna give an arbitrary number, but 150 pounds, 160 pounds, and will you know only be eating a thousand calories a day, 11, 1200 calories a day, um, which you know obviously because and that, that's a that's a massive drop of of calories. And we'll talk a, a, a little bit about that later, but because the low energy intake reduces metabolic activity, right? So your body when you when you eat less calories, your metabolism is gonna slow down because your body thinks survival, right? So Body tries to restore energy balance with increased appetite. So if you ever, right, if, if you've ever been on a diet, what happens? You know, hunger pangs, right? The appetite goes up. Your brain actually, you know, when it looks at a salad or it looks at a cake when you've been, been in uh, restriction for a long time, it goes like, ooh, cake, more calories, survival, right? So think about that. And, and so this is the process that you kind of that, that go through. And then one of two things happens, right? The dieter will fall off the wagon right? So how many times you fall off the wagon? We know, you know, uh, a perfect example is New Year's resolutions. The amount of people, I think if, uh, and like I said, I might be a little bit off here, but you know, over 70% of people within the first three to four weeks uh, fall off when it comes to dieting and New Year's resolutions, right? So the person will fall off the wagon or simply stop dieting once the goal has been achieved. Now, you know, in our seminars, we always ask this question, you know, how, hey, did you ever go on a diet and achieve a goal? And people raise their hands. Uh, and the second question I ask is like, are you still at that goal weight? And most of the time, literally 95% or maybe 100% of the hands go down because they put the weight back on. And so let's say you wanted to lose 20 pounds. So you go on a diet, it's a very, you know, it's aggressive, restrictive diet. And you achieve that goal in eight weeks, 12 weeks, whatever it may be, right? Maybe even less, six weeks, right? You, you, you want to get ready for the swimsuit. You want to drop 15 pounds in six weeks and you do it. Okay. Now, Food intake will usually increase, right? So, man, I hit my goal, even if it's a little bit, right? You're just like, man, you feel restricted. The appetite is up. So now all of a sudden, you're eating a little bit more, maybe a lot more. And so what ends up happening is that despite more energy coming in, metabolism may not go up back to the previous baseline. RMR means resting metabolic rate stays lower than before dying, right? Because what ends up happening is you have, because you've been taking in so, so many fewer calories, your metabolism slows down because your, your body thinks survival, right? You can't operate at the same metabolism that you did before while eating a ton less calories. So it's going to basically drop your metabolism so to be able to keep you alive because that's the primary goal of the brain is like, hey, keep this person alive. Not like make sure that they got six-pack abs, right? That's not the priority of the, of the brain. But then what happens is because you got more energy coming in and metabolism slower, you get weight regain and it's often heavier than before. And I'll actually draw a chart towards uh, the end of this presentation that kind of shows you what ends up happening when a person you know, loses weight 
and you get a rebound, and a rebound tends to be, um, you know, more than uh, even even the starting weight. Meaning, like you might have lost 20 pounds, but then you gain 22. Now that, that's something that's happened to you. This is, you know, this is the explanation of why that happens, and that there's a better approach to go about this, right? Um, which we'll talk about. We'll talk about the habit change. So the, you know, the the the, the advanced strategies, you know, most of the times they backfire, right? It's just like literally pistol analogy, like pointing towards me. Um, you know, I'm shooting myself in the foot. And um, once again, like if, if in the previous kind of cycle, you saw yourself like, hey, yeah, I've, you know, lost weight and gained weight multiple times before, you know, that previous, uh, I would say, chart isn't an explanation of why that happens. Now, what we're going to talk about today a lot is, is outcomes versus behaviors. So, you know, outcome, the outcome is what you want to achieve. So, Let's say 20 pounds, I wanna lose 20 pounds. That's the outcome, okay? And most people are focused on that, right? I gotta lose 20 pounds, I wanna lose 20 pounds. Hey, one week has gone by. Wow, I've only lost you know, a pound or zero pounds or whatever. Ah, you know, now I gotta go, I gotta restrict more, I gotta push harder, right? Whatever it may be. So the, the focus is on the outcomes. Whereas reality is that there's a certain amount and set of behaviors that lead to an outcome. And if we focus on the behaviors, it's been studied and shown that when we focus on the behaviors, we have much, much more success. Because the reality is that like no one, not even the greatest expert in the world could predict exactly how much weight you'll lose every week, every month. Because it's determined by so many different factors that are always changing, it's complex, right? Meaning, path health history, how many times you've dieted before, lifestyle, you know, stress levels, sleep patterns, all these different things. Uh, and of course, like emotional habits and triggers and all these, uh, all these factors. So it, it's difficult to say because you got water retention, you got all, you know, all these different things that will influence you. With women, you got menstrual cycles, right? So you, focusing on outcomes can become very, very stressful. It doesn't mean that you shouldn't set them. It doesn't mean you shouldn't have these goals. You absolutely should. You should have an anchor. You should have something deep, meaningful that pulls you towards your goal you know, of, of whatever it is that you want to achieve. But behaviors are things that you can control. So outcomes maybe you can't control. Like you can't control, you know, if you're in a fat loss journey and you get sick for two weeks. Right? You, like maybe you couldn't control that, right? Or even though you're doing a lot of things right, but you know, you, I, I would say there's two people, right? You got, you got Craig and you got Ken, and Ken is losing weight faster than Craig, but they're both doing the right things, right? And there's a lot of different factors that are influencing that, right? That can be stressful. So Behaviors, you can absolutely always, I would say, control those. Meaning, did I drink a glass of water before every meal today? Did I have 30 to 40 grams of protein with every meal today? Uh, did I get my workout in? Like, you can check all those off, and those are the behaviors. Hey, did I get quality seven plus hours of sleep, right? So if we focus on the behaviors, it, they will lead us to an outcome. But the thing is, too, like, if we change our behaviors to where they become a part of our lives, meaning, behavior is a, pa is, is a habit, we'll stick with those, right? We'll stick with those. So I always say like, you know, when it comes to behaviors, it's like, who I, must I become, right? Not what do I do, who must I become? Because you can do something for eight weeks, you can do something for 12 weeks, you can do something for a certain shorter period of time, but to become someone, it means you do it all the time. Like becoming somebody means like the way that you think, the way that you operate, the way that you do things over and over and over again, no matter what, even in stressful situations. Like I said, because life, uh, you know, there tends to be this thing called the pause button mentality is when people say, well, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll start eating better. I'll start doing the things that I need to when life becomes less crazy. And the reality is life is always crazy. It's a roller coaster. And so we have to adapt and learn how to do these things despite of, right? So even if, you know, you had a 10 hour work day, you know, kids are going crazy, you got less sleep, you have habits that are still in place that will help you get to the desired goals. So I like to say, you know, willpower versus skill power. You know, people rely on willpower a lot, right? And willpower is finite, meaning how many times have you tried to say, hey, you know what, you're going to resist with willpower that those cookies that are in the cupboard, right? And the reality is you'll do a lot better if you just don't have these trigger foods in the cupboard, okay? So think about those things as far as how, you know, we approach uh, this philosophy of change, right? Not relying on willpower, but skill power. Th you know, these are all skill sets. 
eating veggies, you know, seven to eight servings of vegetables every day, that's a skill set. You know, having protein with every meal is a skill set. Mindful eating, you know, and, and eating slower so that satiety kicks in uh, and you don't overeat, that's a skill set, right? So don't rely on willpower. We're going to build skill sets and skill power. So let's go over, you know, this, what, do, what do healthy, lean, uh, you know, performing, like perf uh, high performance individuals do? Now, this can go for anything, right? You know, if, if you're, like I said, if you're looking to just feel better, be more confident, uh, you know, build more muscle, like if, you know, whether you want a six pack or you just, you know, you just want to lose weight to be healthier, to get your, uh, you know, blood pressure in check, it doesn't matter, right? This has been studied, like these are the skill sets that highly successful people when it comes to their health do, right? Skill sets, remember we just talked about those. Now, we're going to dig a little bit deeper into these, so I'm, I'm going to fly through this a little bit faster because this is what we coach on uh, throughout our programs, but like these, this is, um, you know, the things that like really, really end up being important when it comes to, if you have these skill sets, guess what? Like you're going to be healthier, you're going to perform better, your body composition is going to be great, meaning you're going to be lean muscular, whatever the goal that it is you want to achieve. Number one, number one thing, like, and most people, like, you will usually scoff at this and say, Luca, like, listen, man, I came to you for nutrition advice. Why are you putting making time as one of the skill sets? Well, because, first of all, if you're watching this, you're making time, right? To prepare to be successful, you got to make time. If you're doing food preparation, it means making time, right? Making a plan for the week, making time, get, get you know, Calling up a company to give you uh, to get you just lunches delivered, so you're not eating food at the cafeteria. That's not helping you out. Making time, right? These lessons making time. If you're meeting with the coach, if you're meeting with me, you got to make time, right? Time is one of an investment. So I always say, hey, look, in your life, basically where you put your time, energy, and money will show what you're committed to. Now that can sometimes be a tough pill to swallow, but I have a lot of people that say. Hey, Luca, I really am committed. I really want to do this. I promise you, like, this is what I want to take on. And then, you know, when it comes time to put the time or energy or the investment in there, it's like, oh, well, I don't know if I can do that. Well, that just means that you don't want to allocate the commitment and investment into those things, right? So making time is part of, like, putting your, your money where your mouth is or saying, hey, I'm committed to this, okay? Because I always say, like, your calendar and your bank account, right, will show where your focus is. Now, back up a little bit to, so that I can explain what that actually means, okay? What that actually means is, like your calendar, if you look at your day, what you do with your day, like every single thing, every 30 minutes, whatever's happening, right? That's where your focus is. So if, there, if, if in that day there's no meal preparation, thinking about how, you know, your nutrition and, and uh, even like, hey, I'm gonna go to a restaurant, like let me look at the menu beforehand, right? That probably means that's really not your focus and your commitment. Same thing with money, right? Like if your finances are going toward a certain thing and maybe it's like going out two, three days a week and you say, hey, I want to be a lot leaner, but you could spend that money on a meal delivery service that's going to help you get to your, to your goals or a coach that's going to help you get to your goals. That, you know, you, you have to like really like look in the mirror and be, and be truthful with and honest with yourself. Say, hey, what really matters to you? Now, I'm not here to judge whatever matters, okay? But... You can't say one thing and do another. So I say your bank account, your calendar are usually like really, really telltale signs of like where you're currently putting your commitment and your effort. And if you want to change your body, you, you may want to consider shifting that, right? And so making time is a massively important skill set. Like to be able to block out people that are organized that structure their day, get up 15, 20 minutes earlier, create a morning ritual to put themselves into power. Right, this is some, one of the things that we teach that we're not going to dive in as deep today, but it's certainly a skill set. Um, and so I wanted to spend a little bit of time on that to, to, make, you know, to make sure you understand that, like, why that's so important. Then we have eating slowly. Okay? All the cultures that have, I would say, uh, lower obesity rates are healthier. And you know, if, you, uh, if you looked at you know, blue zones, Okinawa or you know, different places around the world where people live to 100 years old, they're very healthy you know, that's one of the things that they do. They actually, they eat slow and mindfully, right? They take the time to eat the food. And uh, there, I mean, I, I just have you, hey, I'd have you consider, set a timer, see how long it takes for you to eat a meal. And, next, and then try to improve that. Like, so if it takes you only five minutes to, to eat a meal, hey, try to do seven, eight minutes. We recommend to get to at least 15 minutes for a meal. 
Because what, it, what happens is also the brain satiety signals kicked in and you actually feel full. That's why if you eat really, really fast, you won't feel full, but then after a little while, you'll feel stuffed, right? So eating slowly is a, and, and there's tactics and strategies like things like, hey, every time you put a bite of food in your mouth, put the fork down, chew before you do it again or setting the timer. Stopping at 80% full, those two go really, really hand in hand. Meaning, right, like in, in America right now, to, people believe that full, at full is actually stuffed, right? But full is actually 20% before you get like stuffed. So just eating a little bit less and being mindful of that. And you know, some of those things that can happen is like eating from smaller plates and things of that nature. Um, but you know, those two really go hand in hand and that's the strategy that we teach. Eating lean protein with each meal, like very, very powerful. I'm actually gonna, in a, in a little bit, I'm gonna show you a little a study that's very powerful to show you how powerful this is. And obviously protein, very important macronutrient. It is, you know, what builds our lean muscle and or maintains it. Um, it's also a very thermogenic food, meaning you burn more calories just digesting protein than you do carbs and fats. So it's very effective when it comes to fat loss. Um, it's also like most uh, protein foods fill you up so there's, they have the satiety. So there's so many positives that go along with that. It's such a big must. It's one of our key components, which I'll show you in a little bit. But also eating at least five servings of colorful fruits and veggies. Um, like, you know, adding more vegetables, which are fibrous. We have micro, they have micro and phytonutrients. Um, same thing, they're filling. They're essential, right? Those are some of the things that, once again, we start, we have strategies that we'll talk about in a little bit on how you would add that. Making smarter carb choices, you know, unprocessed whole foods versus processed foods. And, uh, you know, one of the things about, you know, calories, the calories that like, for instance, when you buy a processed food, you know, whichever one, not, not just carbs, the, the processing has done the work for your stomach. So you're gonna actually absorb more calories than if you eat a, for instance, a whole unprocessed food. So, you know, think, uh, you know, think like a yam versus a, a sweet potato, I mean, a sweet potato fry, right? I mean, you're gonna have different absorption rates of those calories too, not to mention, you know, how, how it works in the digestive system and whether it's healthy or not. Eating healthy fats, fats are massively important to obviously our hormones, inflammation, a number of different things, right? But in America, we have about a, uh, a, a massive, I would say, disconnect between omega-6 and omega-3s. So we need more, uh, I would say, omega-3 fatty acids. Uh, but a good, like I said, a good combination of different fats. We'll talk about that a little bit later too. Planning vigor-friendly meals. I'm, I'm gonna show you guys a, a, a plate that's a great kind of like foundation visually to go off of. I think most people are visual, so they like to see like, hey, what should a great meal look like? Uh, so we just call those vigor-friendly meals. From there on, We've got recording what you eat. Like, no matter what, everything starts like this, okay? If you cannot, uh, awareness precedes change, okay? Awareness precedes change. It's something I've always uh, mentioned, but assessment precedes awareness. So how do we assess what we're doing, right? And, and a GPS, to go from point A to point B, you gotta know, number one, you gotta know where you're going, which is point B, but you gotta know where you're at, and where you're at is point A. And point A is like, hey, what does your day look like right now? What are you eating right now? how much food, which foods, right? So recording what you eat is, is really important. And wh whether that's a journal, whether that's pictures, whether that's MyFitnessPal, like, or you know, some type of app tracking uh, software, it's irrelevant because you know, we'll talk about everybody is different. So just as long as we create awareness around where we are so we can start making changes to where you're going, we're in the right trap. Creating and using a sleep ritual. I mean, as so many studies show, you know, obviously sleep is massively important. If you don't sleep for, if I'm not mistaken, like seven or eight days, like you'll die. I mean, it, so it is that essential. But that's where all the recovery happens. Uh, it's also proven that people that sleep less eat more. Uh, and, and a lot of the, uh, the data on childhood obesity is showing that that is one of the main factors of why kids are becoming more obese is because the lack of sleep, the lack of quality sleep. But nonetheless, I mean, this is one of the things that we, we check right off the bat. And, you know, when we are able to improve people's sleep patterns, uh, most of the time they start losing fat. It's like this, this is great correlation we've seen over the last, you know, I would say 12 years of running gyms and training thousands of people. Uh, drinking only calorie free beverages. Uh, this is a powerful one. The average American drinks over 400 calories per day through drinks. Um, so essentially, if you just cut your drinks from calorie, I mean, even from the, just like a regular Coke to a Coke Zero, you know, from a, from a orange juice to to like 
honestly, like some flavored water that has zero calories, you'd be making a massive change and a massive difference in your diet. Um, you know, so that's a big change and obviously hydrate. You, you, most people are dehydrated. We talk about, you know, what that does to the body. We're going to touch on that in a little bit. Uh, using targeted recovery strategy, strategies. Stress is a massive driver of, uh, I would say, fat, uh, of obesity, but, also, but not just from the standpoint of like what happens stressfully, hormonally, is that it drives behaviors, usually behaviors that are not in line with what you want. Meaning, you know, be, like usually like it triggers eating food or maybe having some alcohol or whatever it may be. So strategies that help you recover, that help you decompress mentally and physically are very, very important. Eating whole foods only. Uh, you know, now we, we certainly don't believe that every person is going to eat 100% whole foods because, you, you know, you should have your, your treats and understand where that fits in. We're going to talk about that a little bit too. But if, if we change the majority of the foods that we eat, you know, from, proce uh, from processed to unprocessed and whole, uh, just that shift in, in the diet will make a huge difference. Okay. Uh, we'll touch on that in a little bit as well. Like just, just some studies around that. A little bit more, a little bit better. That's just one thing that we're always promoting. How can you do a little more and, a little, and or a little better or both, right? So meaning if you did, you know, if, if, you, if you did something good four times last week, can you do it five times this week, right? Uh, if you had, like I said, if you had protein with just breakfast for the last two weeks, can we now add it and have protein with also lunch, right? Just always improving. Protein and colorful plants at each meal. Uh, so like I said, that's just a great combo. If you've got your protein, and you got your color, colorful veggies, especially your green veggies, you're already on the right track. We're going to uh, look at the plate in a second. And then changing your environment. Now, like that, although that one is last, I promise you this, you know, I believe the fastest way to change yourself is to change your environment. Environment can be everything. The books that you read, the people that you're around, but also like your plate. Hey, if your plate is big, that's an environment. Can you make the plate smaller? You're going to eat less food automatically, right? cup sizes, you know, instead of ordering large, ordering medium, like those small changes are going to make massive results in weight loss. And, um, you know, like I said, just, uh, I have an example of a client that we had that, that came in, we made one shift that is a combination of these two, the first month. So one was drink, like switching from regular Coke to Diet Coke, to, to Coke Zero. Uh, the second one was, was cutting down four nights of drinking beer to only two. So it's still there, it's still two nights of drinking beer. Um, and so those two other nights, he changed the environment, meaning he didn't go to the, the same bar with his buddies, but he actually went, well, to train at our gym on those nights, but he changed the environment, okay? He changed the environment. And the first month lost 16 pounds with, I would say, something that may look like pretty subtle changes, but a lot of it was a change in environment that it spurred a very, very positive outcome, and it wasn't massively stressful. So... Wherever he used to be in the bar, he was training hard with a group of people supporting him, right? And like I said, the Coke Zero flavor still had that. It was just that like now all of a sudden you're, you know, you're, you're taking away a couple hundred calories per can of sugar and still switching it with similar flavors, 16 pound you know, fat loss and, and a massive surprise. And like, wow, that wasn't as hard and stressful as I thought it was going to be. And that's the key in everything we do in nutrition is not to make it so overwhelmingly stressful that you're waiting to fall off the wagon, right? You're, you can't wait for it to be done. This is not a, a process of can't wait for it to be done. It's a process of how do we change this for good? So with that said, here's that study that I wanted to show you. More protein, less calories. So these are two different groups over the, uh, the course of 120 days. And you know, one group was basically a baseline group that said, hey, just keep doing what you're doing everything the same as, as, as you have been doing. Group number two, there was only one shift, okay? And that one shift was the, uh, eating 30 to 40, uh, if I'm not mistaken, actually it was like, I think 30 grams of protein, if not 40 grams of protein, four times a day. So in four meals per day, making sure that they get in like 40 grams of protein. Nothing else. They could drink whatever they wanted, uh, you know, eat whatever. Everything else stayed the same. There was, there was no exercise program, uh, there was nothing else that they had to do except for that one thing. And over the course of those 120 days, the group that ate the protein let, ate uh, 441 calories less than the other group and ended up having a much bigger weight loss result. Uh, actually, if you see, this is kilos. So you can see um, the, the difference in kilos. I think it was, uh, ended up being something like 15 pounds or something, 15 or 16 pounds weight loss with just that one shift, just that one shift. All right, so now you can kind of see going back to 
those skill sets, those habits that we talked about, how changing just one or two could, you know, could, could help you within two, three months, depending on how much weight you have to lose, lose 20, 30 pounds. And, it's, and it doesn't seem like a, a massive restriction and change to your life. So we're focusing on like one thing at a time or a couple things at a time. But that's a very powerful study that shows how much you can get done. So it's not a lot of people are like, oh, you know, they look at that list and they go like, oh, this is moving slowly. Absolutely not. This is moving strategically. And if you're strategic, you're going to get results. So it, it essentially like what ten, tends to happen many a times is we get this, right? When we take on a massive shift, let's take an example of a New Year's resolution, right? You go from not training uh, maybe a couple days a week or maybe not training to training five, six days a week, um, you know, taking on a meal plan. Uh, doing all these massive changes, but what it is, it's a huge stressor to the system because your energy is going in all these different directions, right? But what if, you know, we focus all that energy into just one change at a time and we get a massive result? So for instance, you know, perfect example, you go to the gym, there's a coach there, so you're already accountable to that, right? You don't have to really think about it, you just got to show up, okay? And then you start adding protein to every meal, so it's not a hundred different things, it's just a couple or maybe one or two, right? But you're doing all the right things and then you get a big shift. Like you're actually moving forward faster than a person focusing on a lot of things, getting overwhelmed, then they fall off, right? And even if you do get like more short-term results, we're talking about the first 30 days, you know, you detox, you do something, you know, really, 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 I would say uh, aggressive, right? Something that's no way that you can sustain for a lifetime, you know, let alone months. Right? So yes, if you, if you look at subject A and they lose 15 pounds the first month and subject B loses six, right? but they're, they're moving with like this one thing at a time. But then month two, you know, this slows down, this person stays steady and steady and steady. And so by month six, you know, person B has lost 30, 30, 40 pounds and kept them off. They're more confident and comfortable. They're not stressed out. They're not trying to get off the wagon. They've, they've made changes. Where person B by month three, they fell off the wagon. By month four or five, they gain some weight back. By month six or seven, you know, they're back where they were, and then the process continues like we showed at the beginning. So this is a, a better approach that will, you know, garner results. And we've, you know, like I said, we've been doing this for a long time. And our, our I would say, forte and our goal is long-term transformation where you don't have to, I would say, look back. Now, here's a couple of things. We're, we're not going to go into every single one of them, but I want you to show you the approach that we take. Okay, so... What people struggle with many times, for instance, I'll, I'll go off some of the chart and then give you one full example. So what do people struggle with? What do they need help with? And what's a sample of a change that you can make? And we'll, we'll take a couple down here, okay? So eating too many processed foods and not enough, enough nutritious, minimally processed food, that, that tends to be a struggle with a, a lot of people. Not meeting basic nutrient needs, so not getting enough uh, calories or the right macronutrients in. Getting dehydrated. Most people are dehydrated, okay? Um, drinking too many sugary sweetened drinks. We just talked about the average American uh, drinks over 400, between 400 and 500 calories a day. Uh, not feeling satisfied by your meals. So as you eat the meal, you're not even feeling full. So that leads you to eat more. Eating too quickly and while distracted. Uh, in, in a book called Mindful Eating, it shows the status and the data of what happens when we're, we're eating distracted. So watching TV, uh, when we go to the movies, you know, you're always going to eat the whole popcorn. Right? When you're at work and you're eating very, very fast. So that's definitely a limiting factor. Recognizing hunger and fullness cues. A lot of people don't even recognize when they're hungry or are they just eating because they're bored or angry or tired or lonely, right? And understanding those cues, irregular eating habits. But let's look at, and we're gonna go on a couple more on the next page, but let's, let's, let's look at an example here, for instance, right? If somebody that's eating too many processed food and not, not, not enough, um, nutritious, minimally processed foods, what would they need help with? Well, replacing processed foods with whole minimally processed foods like fruits and veggies. So what will be a sample? Well, find two whole food substitutes that you're eating right now and switch them up. So for instance, in an orange instead of orange juice. Believe me, that's a huge example. Like a, you know, a, I would say a glass of orange juice have a ton of squeezed oranges, but there's a lot of sugar in there. Uh, not that sugar is gonna you know, kill you or anything like that, but the calories are really high for glass, right? You could eat a couple of oranges and have more fiber You'd be more full, right, because juice doesn't fill you up. But the, the, the orange will fill you up but certainly a lot more, right, than, uh, than the juice will. And your calorie is going to be much lower. So that's a, that's a perfect example of that, right? Um, so, you know, same thing would be doing something like a fried zucchini. We're exchanging it for something that's, uh, you know, 
kale chips or, or like I said, just uh, putting kale or, or, or spinach in your smoothie, right? The less processed, like the more nutrients you're going to get, the less calories you're going to have. Uh, getting dehydrated, you know, drinking more water. So drink a glass of water when you get up and one at each meal. That's a really simple habit, but it's very tactical, right? You can, you can tick it off. Like, did I do that? Okay. Uh, drinking too many sugar sweetened drinks, exploring better quality drinks. So progress from regular to diet. And then from there to soda water, maybe. Or maybe you stay with diet. That's still way healthier. You know, drinking regular Coke versus Coke Zero. Massive difference. You, throughout the week, it's going to save you hundreds of probably not thousands of calories if you're drinking it daily. So these are some perfect examples. And this is how we'd work with clients one-on-one where we'd start creating these tactical things that we change, right, to make sure that they're moving forward without overwhelm and making this, uh, I would say, this transformation uh, without it being super aggressive. You know, here we got struggle, overeating, right? Uh, using food to manage feelings, that's a, that's a big one. So what would you, in, in there, what would, would the help, uh, you know, what would the person need help with? Well, separating food from feelings, learning to regulate and express their emotions in healthy ways. Something that most people don't, uh, don't, don't really talk about, but you know, if, if food is the thing that uh, you use to deal with stress, anxiety, you know, overwhelm, if you can find an, uh, an outlet for those things, like I said, like working out, being in, a, in an active community, having an activity group, what I like to call, whether that's yoga, hiking, whatever else it may be, you know, going to places where people are supportive and trying to reach the same goals as you, then you can replace that and start eating more in line with the food. So like keeping food and feelings journals uh, for a week and choosing one practice other than op uh, option for noticing, expressing regular eating motions. So meaning, right, writing, drawing, talking to a friend, going for a workout, going for a walk, that replaces eating food when you're stressed out. So that would be uh, another, for instance, tactic. And like I said, we would dive a lot deeper, right? Basic food preparation skills is something most people struggle with. Shopping and food awareness. So here we'd learn to shop efficiently, effectively, being uh, an informed about an informed consumer, like being able to look at food labels, knowing what's a higher protein food, you know, how many carbs, how many fats it has. Learn to cook, then practice for two goal meals, right? Uh, I have this something, uh, this thing called one, two, three model. So you have a one breakfast, two lunches, and three dinners. Like you learn how to do those, and then you just you basically just rotate those. Okay, but these are all tactical things that address something that somebody's struggling with. But like I said, this is not cookie cutter. It's not the same for everybody. We're going to touch on like what our model over the years has learned. And uh, one of the big things, obviously, is not being consistent, right? Busyness and stress, overwhelming life demands. Notice how we're touching on things that most people usually don't talk about. Like, X, you know, people talk about X's and O's. Here's your macros. Here's how many calories you should eat. But these are all the struggling and limiting factors that come to like the bottleneck for you changing your nutrition. Much, you know, this is a big, big difference uh, because you, we gotta look to the cause, right? It's just like, it's like, a, it's like disease, right? You have a symptom and you can fix the symptom maybe with a pill, like the symptom goes away, but it keeps coming back because we've never changed the cause. It's the same thing with nutrition. We wanna look for the cause, we wanna address the cause, and then we wanna become consistent, achieving consistency, right? And so this is what we do with almost everybody is track consistency for assigned tasks daily. Reward consistent execution rather than being perfect. You're not going to be perfect. No, nobody's going to be perfect. But shooting for, for, for perfection is fine, but not being stressed when you fall short. For instance, hey, if you were 20% compliant a month ago and a month later you're 50% compliant, that means you're getting better, right? So we call it the acknowledging your win strategy, right? Basically, like every day looking at all the things that you did well. Right? It builds confidence, it builds self-esteem. And that's massively important because one of the big reasons that people fall off is they beat themselves up. Like honestly, it's not like, look, it's, it's, you're not a bad person for having made, like, gone off track. And so you can't beat yourself up and it drives the same behaviors, okay? That's, and, and we really focus on helping the person, like, win, right? We're gonna help you get a lot of wins fast so that it builds your self-esteem and confidence, we can build on it. Taking on too much, makes you lose, right? Because now all of a sudden you're not achieving all the things you set out to do and then you feel like a failure. And that is absolutely the, the worst strategy when it comes to change is to take on so much and then feel like you're a failure, okay? So these are some of the things that people struggle with and the reason that we, we, we plugged it in. Now notice, like, this is like a, a chart for PN I like to use. So at the top here is your goal. We talked about outcome goals. So let's say this goal is, you know, uh, 
drop 40 pounds, uh, 8% body fat, and lower my blood cholesterol or my blood pressure by a certain amount. Okay, well, we're gonna look at like, what's month one? You know, what are the skills? Remember we talked about skill power. What are the skills that we wanna develop that are gonna take us to this outcome, okay? And so some of those skills made month one maybe, you know, uh, eating slower, right? Have, eating 50, you know, having each meal be 15 minutes. Adding protein to every meal. Uh, having a glass of water with, uh, you know, dehydrating more and cutting out the calories from drinks. And then we break it down. Okay, first practice. What are we gonna do the first two weeks? Right, what are we gonna do the second two weeks? Notice we create a chart, we create a map, we create a plan on how we're gonna get you there, right? I always say, when you don't have a path and a plan, the default is struggle. So if you don't have a path and a plan, your default is gonna be to like what you're doing right now and what you're doing right now got you where you are, right? So we wanna change that. We wanna change the trajectory of where you're going. So the way that we break this down is like what, what I like to call a behavior map. So, you know, you could use this for anything. Here's the cool thing about this, right? This is behavior change. So you could use this for any, any area of your life, but we're gonna work specifically on, obviously, nutritional changes and give you an example. So behavior map, what do I wanna do? I mean, honestly, you could put in, like, get rid of my low back pain, get rid of inflammation. You know, um, what I wanna do, lose 30 pounds. What I wanna do, build 15 pounds of muscle, right? And then you have, different behaviors that you track down here, okay? That we, we just, you know, we went over a bunch of skill sets and behaviors that we talked about at the beginning and you plugged them in. And then you ask yourself, okay, what does, it, uh, what does it involve and why does it matter? It's important to ask yourself why it matters because it gives meaning to the reason why you're doing the task, okay? How will I know if I've done it? Like, what will tell me that I've actually achieved this? And then what will tell me it's time to move on, right? So you gotta achieve a certain level of consistency at a certain time uh, amount of times that you did something before we go like, hey, okay, cool, now you can build on this. You know, a lot of people jump the gun too fast, take on too many things at once, and then can't stay consistent. And consistency is what will get you to your goals for good and keep you there. All right, so that's massively important. So let's look at an example here, okay? So if I was like, what do I want to do? I want to build muscle, all right? Behavior one would be work out regularly. So why, what does that involve? Well, for instance, in this example, it'll be like training three times a week and following a specific workout plan. So I don't know, like the, this week we just had, I think six or seven people join our, our, our programs, different programs, and we've had people that, you know, uh, specifically two guys that I can remember right now that wanting to build muscle. And they're gonna be coming in three times a week, doing strength training, so they can do that. Well, why does that matter? Because regular workouts stimulate muscle growth and improve strength. All right, it's a prerequisite, like that's what we have to do, okay? How will I know if I've done it? I'll have completed my workout journal for the day. For, for these guys, in this case, would be, hey, I would have co I've come to Vigor Ground three days a week and follow my strength training program with the coach, right? So what will tell me it's time to move on? I'll have done three workouts per week consistently for two weeks. I'll be planning and preparing for my workouts with a calendar and system. So that might be, if you don't have a coach, that might be something that you'll do. But at the end of the day, if you ticked off your workouts for two weeks straight and you went three times a week, Man, you've, you're being pretty consistent. Now we can add the next thing. What's behavior two? Add one nutrient-rich, high-quality meal, okay? I love super shakes, so what, what does this involve? A super shake per day. So a super shake is a shake, first of all, they all taste delicious. We, just, we give a whole, I would say, guide to our clients to have a number of super shakes, some that are like more carb-friendly, that are more like any time of the day. Some of them are you know, post-workout, some of them are muscle-building shakes. It tastes fantastic, but it's an easy way. It takes you three minutes, four minutes to make, right? One of the I love to make that I, I almost have every day, but it's like if I make it at home, it's ice, almond, almond milk, half a banana, tons of spinach, blueberries, a little bit of almond butter, and then I put in you know, collagen uh, protein and also a whey protein, and then blend all that stuff up, and it's, it tastes fantastic, right? But that would be a super shake. So it's a simple strategy that we would add to somebody trying to build quality muscle. Right? Why does it matter? Well, because it gives you me lean protein, fruits, veggies, and healthy fats conveniently. So the shake that I just shared with you does all of those things, and it's convenient, it's fast, it's not difficult to do. How will I know if I've done it? Well, I've made and drunk a super shake every day. I'll take it off in my consistency journal. Right Now you have apps for this. There's a lot of ways you can do it. You can go old school journal it. You can take it off in your app. You can put in like your MyFitnessPal, so you can show, like if, if I'm your coach, so you can show me that you did it, okay? And what will tell me it's time to move on? Well, I've made and drank a super shake for two weeks. I'll have planned this into my routine of trusted systems to get it done. Our goal is to be 
85 to 90 percent compliant. Even 80 percent will tell me that we can move on. So that means, you know, in two weeks you have 14 days. If you did it for 90 or 80 percent of the time, that means that you did it for about, let's say, eh, I would say 11 days. 11. If you got it 11 out of 14 days, you're pretty damn consistent, and you can move on to the next thing. Number three, add lean protein, right? So have two pounds of lean protein at each meal. And then behavior four, create and use a sleep ritual because it's tough to build muscle if you're not resting and recovering well, right? And so that's, you can see that how, like, uh, you know, why does that matter? Well, creating an, uh, an anabolic environment requ requires recovery. Very hard to build muscle if you're not eating enough and eating right and resting enough, right? So you can see, like, we have a plan for at least about, I would say, two months here. And it's different for everybody. Somebody might be able to knock this out faster. Somebody might take them, you know, three months. It's individual, and that's why I hate doing cookie cutter stuff. But you can see this behavior map, and we have very strategic, tactical things. This is exactly what you should do. You know, here on the add lean protein to every meal, you could have two palms. If we're doing macros or calories with somebody, we would say, hey, 40 grams per meal, right? 20 grams per snack. Notice, like, we, we use very individual tactics based on how the, it's, we fit nutrition to the person and the person's lifestyle. We don't try to, you know, smash around, peg through a square hole. And I think that's, very important, right? So when we do these, when we do challenges, when we do things that, uh, like basically this is essentially an intro. We do a lot of uh, six-week catalyst programs we call challenges, you know, and we say, hey, this will be the recommendation if you're coming in and doing, uh, you know, these six weeks. So this is like what we would recommend for the first six weeks to be successful. And this is based on, like I said, training now over 2,700 people, like face-to-face, uh, this doesn't even count online and everything else in our gym in Slovenia. This just counts the one in Seattle, over 2,700 uh, success stories. And so with that said, you can see we call them habit stacks, just levels, okay? So level one, and this is not set in stone. This is the other thing that I, I, I really rec uh, you know, recommend saying. is like nothing that I say is set in stone. Uh, you know, if I'm working with an individual person, uh, like I said, we would completely customize this. But what we found over time is that when people do this, they're very successful, okay? So level one would be mindful eating, eating until they're 80% full, right? That goes in line with eating slower. So, uh, you know, eating, taking 15 minutes per meal. And that doesn't mean, like, if you're only spending five minutes per meal right now, it means that, like, hey, go from five to eight, go from eight to 10, right? Go from 10 to 12, like, progress it. Uh, number two is eating one to two palms of protein with every meal. I'm gonna show you for men and women how much, uh, like, basically uh, where you should be with this. Eating half a plate of veggies with every meal. Like I said, you're not going to start there necessarily, but that's where you want to get to, okay? Replacing snack foods with fruit. This is a big one. I'm going to show you a really cool study uh, about how people that snack on, on fruits versus, like I said, you know what type of snacks I'm talking about, become very, a, a lot more su successful. And only drinking zero, zero calorie beverages. Making these shifts, and like I said, you know, for most people, it'll take them six weeks or longer to make these changes and we'll, the, like they'll see really, really, really great results. Now, some of this stuff obviously can get very, a lot more specific. From there, you move to level two, which is tracking food with, he, uh, with calories or hand-based portions. Now, some people prefer to add that to level one, which is perfectly fine, right? Me personally, I, I like people to track what they're eating no matter what. Sometimes not even for the fact that they see, you know, the exact calories and we give them exact macros, but it's to be, create awareness of where they're at. Trust me, like if, if, if you give a person, you know, uh, a task to start tracking and they start tracking in the first week, they realize, you know, that they're eating over 3,000 calories every day. And when we talked about what would be a great goal for them to get the results that they want would be 2,000. They'll automatically understand, wow, I'm eating 1,200 calories over. And that, like, that awareness is going to drive their behavior. It's going to shift it. Even without very specific guidelines, hey, eat, it, eat exactly this, eat exactly that, they're going to start shifting. So that's why I like tracking food as an awareness tool even in level one. But the habits that we want to achieve are, are the ones that are listed here. Then level two is like we start focusing on adding one or two closed fist portions of carbs and one or two thumbs of uh, fats a meal. And like I said, I just showed you a study where... The only thing that was asked was to add 40 grams of protein to every meal, nothing else. Nobody was talking about carbs, fats, anything else. And there was an amazing result, and that was without any exercise, without any training. So that's very, very powerful, okay? 
And we talk about like, you know, move to level two when you're 80% compliant, at least 80% compliant, right? You don't have to be 100% compliant, but 80%. And move to level three, only, you know, same thing when you're 80% compliant. This is when we'd start doing like things like post-workout meals, anytime meals, uh, you know, things that are, are certainly can be helpful, but this is, I would say, the meat and potatoes, pun intended, um, when, it, when it comes to success. And once again, like we go back and I encourage you to understand that like every single person is individual. And I got a whiteboard where I might be able to show, you know, draw some stuff up for you guys to give you some examples of what certain uh, individual examples look like. Uh, we talked about, you know, one of the, the like, I, I don't care which route you go as long as the route is right for you when it comes to tracking, okay? So some people, like, that, like I said, applications and technology is really allowing us to make things simpler, right? So being able to even like now you can take pictures of food and it will calculate, you know, in the, in, in the, uh, in the apps. Now the thing is, you know, that uh, Precision Nutrition did a great article on this that like, first of all, fo most food labeling can be up to 25% off. Uh, you know, that's, that's a massive amount. And, and, and basically most gadgets that tell you how many calories you're burning can be up to 25 or even more percent off. So obviously food tracking is very, very complex. Uh, and the only way that you could truly know how many calories you're burning and taking in is to be plugged up to a device in a lab all day long. But you know, that, that doesn't mean it's a bad thing, but it do, what it does do, it creates a lot of awareness around it, meaning that like, you know, at least we have variables that we're tracking. So with that said, I do like something like a, I would say a visual, what we call the handful diet, right? Where we can see, uh, you know, how much at, you should eat at every meal if it was just based on hand, uh, hand signals, right? So protein, a palm, you know, we teach, uh, we teach our clients, a palm of protein is essentially one serving. But for women, it's one palm, for men, it's two palms. And like I said, that's kind of like a base generic thing. Uh, and I'm going to tell you guys at the bottom, like how you can adjust this. Like vegetables, a fist, right? Carbs is a cupped hand, okay? So because you could easily like fit that and then basically fat as a thumb. Now, obviously that's not crazy precise, but it gives you an idea. And for most people, like this is a really good marker of like where they should be. You could go to a restaurant and go like, okay, that's a palm size of protein. Hey, that's a, you know, that's a fist full of ve veggies. That's a cupped hand of carbs, two cupped hands of carbs, right? It's pretty simple to understand that. And like we like simplicity because I know for some people, uh, I know that our clients in the past, they feel, you know, going to social settings like restaurants and having to pull out a calculator and taking pictures of food, it can create, uh, I would say, issues socially, right? And like I said, no, I'm not here to judge. I'm here to find the best solution for you so that you get changes, lose weight, lose body fat, build lean muscle the simplest way possible with the least overwhelm, right? And so this is one of the ways. And then you basically adjust portions up or down according to how frequently you eat. You know, so if you only eat two meals a day, you might have to double up on that, right? Um, your size caloric needs, how active you are, the, the harder you train, you're going to add, obviously, uh, more portions, more servings. Your results, which is big, like we're tracking things, right? If you're going in the right direction, you're losing weight, great. You know, if you're building muscle, if that's what you want, great. If not, we make adjustments. You know, we, we add some protein or carbs or fats or take it away, depending on where you're at. Appetite and satiety, how frequently you eat, right? So like I said, we adjust all these things to you. You know, some people like to eat only two, three times a day. Great. Some people like to eat five times a day. Neither is right or wrong. It's only what's right or wrong for you, right? The old analogy of like, hey, you got to eat five, six, seven meals a day because it keeps your metabolism burning is, is a bunch of bullshit. Uh, you know, now the studies have shown that it doesn't really matter because once again, um, you know, the thermogenic effect of food is really around the, the total amount of calories and from which macronutrients they come from throughout the day. So whether you ate seven meals or ate two, it doesn't matter. Now, what does matter is, you know, it's optimal to eat protein about, uh, you know, four times a day to get the maximum protein uptake. So if you want to build muscle, that uh, it is better to have three to four meals a day uh, with the right amount of protein to get you there. But once again, this is why we like to customize uh, to people and just give pointers. But hopefully this helps you out a lot that you don't have to always be, you know, on an app tracking everything if that stresses you out because I know it stresses out some of our clients while some of our clients love that. So once again, no strategy for one person, 
no cookie cutter program for one person. We adapt that, right? So why is eating protein with every meal important? Well, one, one thing I didn't mention earlier is that it regulates blood sugar, right? We talk about insulin and, you know, how most people have, I would say, high insulin. So they, they, they are, uh, let's just say it's, it's not healthy. And if you want to lose fat, like, that's not where you want to be. And you want to regulate those blood sugars and not have, like, these massive spikes. Um, protein helps keep, uh, keep lean body mass. It significantly increases satiety. It has a higher thermic effect of food. So we talked about that. You burn more calories digesting it than other, other macronutrients and a lot more to the degree that you, you, uh, you I would say, you burn about 30% of the, the calories digesting protein, where if I'm not mistaken, it's only about 10 or 12 uh, with carbs and only like two or three with fat. So these, these are huge differences, right? For, for most active men, six to eight palm sized servings of protein per day. For most active women, four to six palm sized servings per day. So if you're tracking in macros, we like to go for 0.75 to one gram of protein per pound of body weight. So perfect example here, 150 pound person would eat 113 to 150 grams per day. So if they wanted to have you know, four meals per day, we'd shoot for about 35 to 40 grams of protein per meal, right? And, once, you know, and, and then we can start going like, hey, what are the different foods that have that? And then get them on track with those things. So you can see why protein is very important as one of our main habits, one of our main skill sets that we add. Eating to 80% full, eating mindfully. So we talked about the full versus stuffed, right? So we want to be full but not stuffed. Hey, most people end up being stuffed. So just slowing down the pace of eating. Uh, one thing is a timer that creates awareness around how long you eat. Uh, putting the fork down during your bites. Eat away from distractions. This is big, and most people here in this country, they eat while they're doing, they're watching television, they're working, or that are at a computer, which is, once again, studies show that with those things, you're going to overeat, okay? So becoming aware of hunger and fullness cues uh, and being aware of halt. So I mentioned this earlier, but I'm gonna slow it down. Like, what does halt mean, okay? It's, it's a asking yourself that question. Am I eating because I'm hungry, angry, lonely, or tired? So if you're truly hungry, you know, you eat. But the thing is, mo many times, you know, stress, anger, boredom, uh, I, I would say loneliness can drive eating. And, and that can become a pattern. We talked about replacing that emotional, uh, being able to express those emotions in, in different ways also helps us take control of our nutrition. Um, if the goal is a fat loss, then feeling a little hungry is normal. You should be feeling a little hungry, right, if the goal is fat loss. So, you know, feeling full all the time, but working to lose fat, they don't go hand in hand. It doesn't mean you should be starving, but you should be a little bit hungry. Uh, you know, one of our goals is taking 15 minutes to eat a meal. That's a good goal to get to. Uh, another one of those habit stacks that we talked about is eating half a plate of veggies at every meal. So vegetables are filled with vitamins, minerals, phytonutrients, water, and fiber to help fill you up during meals, stay full between meals, and keep you healthy and recover from your workouts. Like I said, those are all things that also help with recovery. You know, when people talk about recovery, obviously there's sleep, there's reducing stress, uh, but there's also nutrition. With that, we recommend six to eight fist-sized servings for active men and four to six fist-sized servings of active women. Doesn't need to be perfect, do more than you are now. You know, one of the things that I always say is like, it's gonna be very difficult for you to overeat on vegetables. Now, I wanna show you some, uh, some, a great picture here that's gonna show you some cool stuff, okay? So let's look at like, you know, when you look at calories, you know, and, and like nuts pack a punch. I mean, they're not, they're not, nuts are healthy, but like in smaller portions, but otherwise they can t pack a ton of calories, right? There's a lot of things that you eat throughout the day. We just talked that like most people drink over 400 calories per day in just beverages. And then imagine this, right? Like a cucumber, a cup is 16 calories. Asparagus, 27. Baby spinach, seven calories, okay? Broccoli, 31 calories. Brussels sprouts, which I've learned to love and are delightful if you have charred Brussels sprouts, 38 calories, right? Radish, 18, mushrooms, mushrooms, which are very fibrous and meaty, right? They have, a, a, and, and for, for vegetarians and vegans, this becomes a source of, of, of great protein and fiber. Only 15 calories per cup. Zucchini, 20 calories per cup. Watercress, four calories, right? Kale, five calories per cup. What I'm trying to say is that like, imagine eating, for instance, uh, you know, five cups of Brussels sprouts and five cups of kale. Literally, you're under 200 calories. I mean, you would be full for a majority of the day because they're, they're so filling, right? So 
adding these foods into your meals ends up making you fuller faster. And then even if you try to eat more food and more calories, it'd be very difficult for you to do. And so I like to call, you know, I like to add things into the diet before we take anything away, meaning it's called a dietary displacement. So if you add protein to your meals and then add a half a plate of veggies, I'm, I'm going to tell you like, hey, after that, eat whatever else you want. The, the, the issue, and this is a positive issue, is going to be you're not going to want to because you're going to be full. But now you're going to be full of quality nutrients. And like, like I said, you're going to be high nutrient uh, uh, density, low calorie density. And that's what we want, right? Especially if the goal is weight loss and fat loss. So this is massively powerful. Uh, Miss Cauliflower, which is another one that I love, 27 uh, calories per cup, right? Start adding more of these into every plate and you're going to see a lot of great things happening. Uh, you know, with, I talked about super shakes, but, you know, turn your boring protein smoothie into a super shake. I always love that, right? Because we we're always going to have a base. Notice, like, whether it's water, almond milk, you know, coconut milk, whatever it may be. After that, we're going to add some type of pro uh, protein powder. And if you're a vegetarian or vegan, it could be hemp, rice protein, all, you know, could be whey, could be beef, could be collagen, could be a lot of different proteins. From there, we go to vegetables, right? Color vegetables. From there, we go to some fruit. Then we go to some type of fat, almond butter, peanut butter, MCT powder, um, avocado, right? And then we add some type of garment, like for instance, like I love dark, I love dark chocolate, cinnamon, things like that. I mean, that is like to almost the dessert, you know what I mean? And, and honestly, like I love these. They taste delightful. You know, it's an easy way to make them. Uh, I, I like these to be substitutes for breakfast a lot of times, right? Quick to make, easy to make, taste delicious. They're pretty filling. Um, and you're getting a lot of the right stuff to, to start off the day. And it's one of our, our rituals and habits, right? Uh, drinking zero calorie uh, beverages. Now look, water, like these, you know, what does water do? I mean, like we need it for survival. It transports nutrients and oxygen. It, it's, it's involved in dissolving, cleaning, reacting, padding, uh, and regulating body temperature. So things we need to live. Water makes you fuller, so you, uh, so you eat less. Now, studies have shown that it doesn't make you as full as people will say you do, but uh, you know, people do in the U.S. do drink 400 calories plus a day on average. Now, this is some cool studies here, okay? Studies show that people that drank 500 milliliters, so it's one of those smaller bottles of water, uh, of water before they ate, over the course of 12 weeks, lost more, four times more body fat than the ones that didn't, all other factors being the same. So think about that. You drink one 500 milliliter of bottle of water three to four times a day, and it had four times the fat loss of a person that didn't. Once again, we come back to this powerful study off of just one small strategic, strategic habit that's going to get you there. There's another study that showed that researchers found that you use 24% more calories for an hour after drinking 500 milliliters of water. This happens because of changes in, in uh, osmolarity and brings the th uh, things back to balance. So. If you want to know some of the geeky stuff that, that tickles your fancy, uh, that's why. But, you know, tw for 60 minutes, 24% more calories burn because you drink water. So if you do that four times a day, four more hours of a quarter more calories being burned. That adds up. So you can see one of our clients here, Caitlin, that had this little a reminder thing. Good morning. You can do this. Like, you know, she was just going through that four gallon, I'm sorry, a, a, gallon, a gallon bottle throughout the day uh, to knew she was done. And it's like you can see here, yes, I'm done. So that was just a way of, like I said, tactically going through that. She saw a lot of positive changes because of that, okay? So we just have some infographics here. And you can see, like, look, Healthy Aid Kombucha, Zevias, you know, Coke Zeros, like, they're not horrible. Uh, you know, people start saying that, like, you know, they have, like, all the aspartame and things like that. Uh, new studies have come out that the chemicals that are in, for instance, like a Coke Zero, you'd have to drink, like, 120 bottle, uh, bottles per day for it to even negatively affect you in any little way. Now, I don't know anybody that's drinking 120 bottles a day. And there's other foods that have a lot of these things in there that are usually not discussed. You got flavored waters that are a much better choice than maybe what you're currently doing, like orange juices, the, the fully, uh, I would say the full, um, uh, you know, like Coca-Cola's that have the full sugar in them and things like that, right? This is a, a powerful one that people rarely, rarely talk about. We found this to be really, really good uh, with our clients, a really good shift. So replacing snack foods with fruit on the countertop. Uh, why? I mean, fruit is high in fiber and micros and it's much lower in calories. I mean, like literally a bowl of blueberries like this is, you know, uh, I would say it has a ton of fiber and so much lower in calories and even like, you know, just like uh, two bars of chocolate that it ends up being in the hundreds, right? It can satisfy sweet cravings and curb cravings. 
And uh, this is what's really, really, really intriguing is a Syracuse study showed they could predict someone's body weight based on a food they had sitting on their countertops. And they found out that people that had fruit sitting on their countertops, uh, things like fruit, things like protein snacks, uh, they could predict that they were much healthier and had lower uh, body weight than the people that did not have that, right? So they had, they had snacks that didn't fit in line with that as much, right? From here on, uh, we have tracking macros. That's our level two. Now, you know, using apps makes this easy. And start by tracking without beating yourself up, right? These are just numbers. Don't attach yourself to the numbers or you being a good or bad person. This is just showing you where you're at, right? It's just an awareness tool, okay? Approach it step by step. Get protein right, then calories, then carbs, then fat. So what we usually tend to do with this is, you know, we will set goals. Now, if, if you're, like I said, if, you're, if you have a fat loss goal, we'll usually go somewhere between 10 to 12 calories per pound of body weight. So I'll use myself as an example. I'm a little over, but let's say I'm about 200 pounds. And if my goal was fat loss, and I'm actually, if I was really active, I'd probably go about 12 calories per pound of body weight. So my goal would be 2,400 calories per day, right? If I wanted more aggressive fat loss, I'd go 10 calories per pound of body weight. That would be then 2,000 calories per day, okay? And, you know, if I wanted to go extreme, I'd go lower. But, you know, with most people, I, I, I certainly wouldn't do that. Like I said, this is very individual, okay? Now, from there, you know, uh, I, I like macros as far as breaking things down. And uh, we're, we're, we're not going to go too deep into this. But basically for someone, you know, a split of, for instance, 40, 35, 25, uh, and like I said, we can shift these around a little bit uh, depending on, like, look, protein always stays the same. We talked about how, you know, 0.75 to 1 gram uh, per pound of body weight is our goal. And then we shift the carbs and fats for, but for a number of things. Number one is preference, right? Some people like to, you know, eat carbs more than they like to eat fat. Some people like to eat fat more than they like to eat carbs. And we want to find a strategy that's going to work long term. Uh, you know, studies show that, like I said, the most important thing is overall calories, calories in, calories out. And uh, it, those things that, you, you know, right now you have a lot of things that's, that are popular, you know, whether it's ketogenic diets, low carb, paleo. Uh, and the reality is that, like, you know, I'm not against, like, you know, what's the best diet? The best diet is the one that works. The best diet is the one that's applied to the client's lifestyle and it's going to be able to be consistent with. Now, you know, certain things are not that great for adherence long term. You know, so we're always speaking to the client on, you know, about like what's going to be best for them and that. And, you know, it, it's, it's easy for the marketplace and the marketing to take over and go like, oh, you should do keto because of this, that and the other. And like I said, if, you know, if that fits you, great, let's test that. Let's see where it's going. But I just want to make sure that like there's principles that we talked about and there's, there's habits and skill sets that are going to make you successful. OK, so with that said, like I said, you know, uh, I'll dig deeper. Uh, in a separate video on on going uh, more into the macro style base. Like if you're trying, you know, uh, there's different body types. So think ectomorph, somebody that's skinnier, like really hard for them to, uh, to, to gain uh, weight. You know, we're going to have a different breakdown. That person is probably going to eat more carbs than, um, they're going to need to eat less protein, but more carbs than somebody that, you know, is a overweight and, you know, has insulin issues. Uh, we might shift those macros. But at the end of the day, once again, this is more, a more advanced strategy. Uh, you know, a lot of people want to jump the gun to this where for, for many it might be much better to just see total calories in the day, making sure they're protein. And that's why I say, you know, get your protein right, right? Rather than having all the macros down, like, hey, get 40, you know, get your grams of protein in every meal throughout the day. And if you can do that, it's going to help change a lot of stuff. If you add the veggies, then, you know, that half plate of veggies that we talked about, you get that down, you're automatically going to start having some dietary displacement and eating less of the other foods. And it's less stressful that way. You know, like always having to feel like you have to hit certain numbers and always tracking can be stressful. Once again, I'm not saying it's right or wrong. Question is, is it right or wrong for you at this point in time? Right? There's a path that's best for you. And that's the one that we want to outline. So, you know, we talked about hand-based portions. Uh, so you already saw that. Like this is the visual, you know, like that is just good to see if you were having a, a balanced meal, this is what it would look like. So you got your proteins right here, you know, red meat, chicken, fish, eggs, plant source, you know, if, if you're a vegetarian, vegan, uh, you can see this 
this little piece here is starches, sweet potatoes, potatoes, whole grains, bread. Right? Then we got fats, healthy oils, nuts, seeds. And then you can see that half a plate of veggies and that almost side dessert uh, of, of fruit. Right? And then you got the water or tea. So this will be optimal, but it's a good visual to go like, hey, does your plate look like this? Does, does it mean that you can't go any other route? Absolutely not. There's a lot of different ways you can do it there. You know, me personally, I like to eat my biggest meals in the evening. Uh, I, I eat lower carb throughout the day, uh, but I certainly love carbs. And after I train, I have a massive amount of carbs, right? Everybody is different. Uh, but this is a really good thing to aspire to, uh, to have a balanced meal plate. And uh, I like the drag and drop option. You know, the plate that I just shown you, here's a great thing about it. Like maybe you guys can't see this, but like, you know, we have protein, vegetables, smart carbs, healthy fats. And you can make this chart for yourself, um, like with whatever you wanted to. For instance, here in protein, you got beans, you got eggs, you got chicken breast, you got steak, you got shrimp, red lentils with vegetables, you got broccoli, red cabbage, green beans, hickory, like you got spinach, you got kale, so on and so forth, right? Spaghetti squash, red potatoes, sweet potatoes, brown rice, quinoa, okay? And then you got all types of different fats. So imagine that plate and it's like, what are the foods that you love and you would just drag and drop those foods, okay? You just pretty much drag and drop those foods and create your own meal place, right? So that's the approach that I really like. You're gonna always choose the foods that you love, okay? And well, the thing is like, how, well, how do you decide, right? How do you decide on which habits to take upon? I gave you a recommendation of what's worked for us over the, you know, the last 11, 12 years, those habit stacks, but how do you decide? Well, you decide based on what you wanna do on goals, right? And then you decide also on knowledge. What do you know? A lot of people try to take on certain habits where they're not very knowledgeable yet, right? And I like to say, you know, go with the hello hanging fruit. What are your strengths? Whatever your strengths are, and play to those strengths, right? And then competence and skill, what you can do. So for instance, if you don't cook at all, you know, some people are like, man, they, they don't cook a lot. You know, I certainly think that's a skill set that should be learned and it will help you tremendously in your, in your fat loss goal of maintaining that. But it might not be the first thing to take on. If you're not a really good cook, maybe you will, you know, you're, you're going to choose different options when you go out to eat or, you know, food delivery service. Um, you know, we have a, a, a collaboration with Northwest Fit Meals here at, at Vigor Ground to make it easier. And honestly, it's something that I order uh, for lunches because that's the thing that usually is tough for me. So now that I have my meals ready, I change the environment. It makes it easier for me. So, you know, competence and skill is very important. And then consistency, what you can do repeatedly and well. I'll, I'll repeat this, okay? If you can't do it repeatedly and do it well, there's no need to move on to the next thing. Or maybe, you know, it's not the right thing for you at that point in time, right? So, for instance, you know, tracking your macros very diligently may be a huge step. But, you know, having protein with every meal and having, uh, you know, water before every meal in the morning when you wake up, that might be the first, you know, the first habits that we'll attack and we'll find strategic ways to do that. You can still track those things, but you're not going to be overwhelmed by, you know, numbers, trying to hit things specifically and whatnot. Okay. So these are like, this is how you pick, uh, you know, which tasks to take on, which habits to take on. Right. And I'm, I'm always, you know, this, there's a magic question that we ask clients. On a scale of one to 10, how confident are you that you can do this 90% of the time? Okay. So. On a scale of one to 10, how confident are you that you can do this you know, 90% of the time? And the reality is if a person answers eight, nine, or 10, we'll go with that habit. So I'll give you an example, okay? Uh, if I said, hey, Gene, you know, how confident are you that you can you know, have protein with every meal on you know, your four meals a day, 90% of the time? And he said, man, I'm, you know what? I, I'm already doing, I'm close to that. I think that I'm a nine on that. Great, then we'd go with that habit, right? Now, if he said a seven or a six, that means that habit was, is, is probably too difficult because you know, it's been proven that if you, if you don't have a high confidence of something, of doing a certain task, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. You actually will not do that task. So we got two options here you know, to find out what would make that person confident, a nine or a 10 with that task, or we make that task a little simpler. Hey, can you just do 40 grams of protein with your breakfast? Yeah, I'm a nine on that. Great, let's start there. And then we track that for the next 10 to 14 days. And if he did it 80, 90% of the time, we'd move on to the next thing and maybe add protein to a lunch and add protein to a dinner. 
right? But this is a magic question. This is something you have to ask yourself honestly, brutally honestly, you know, whether it's the way to go, okay? So making sure the goal, you know, the goal is to keep the goal the goal. That's a Dan John quote. But, you know, many times what happens is that people start adding a lot of different things into their programs, their training, their nutrition. You know, they start like looking into supplementation and it's going away from the main goal. So if your main goal is to feel better, to lose weight, but specifically body fat, maintain your lean muscle or build it. Like, let's look at the task. You know, is your behavior matching your goal? That's another question that I love to ask. And, you know, it's like, hey, is your behavior matching your goal? Well, you know, I'm going out three days a week right now having drinks with my friends. Okay, you told me that you wanted to achieve this. Is that behavior matching your goal? It's harsh, but it's like, look, if I care about you, I'm going to ask you some difficult questions because I want what's best for you. And my mission is your goal. My mission is for you to win. So, you know, I'm going to ask, hey, the goal is to keep the goal the goal. Are your behaviors matching your goals? Or all of a sudden are your, you know, goals kind of uh, change in trajectory, Right. Very important thing, okay? So, number one, get clear on exactly what you wanna do. Do one strategic thing at a time, maybe maybe a couple, but no more than that. Because the thing is, if you own it, you'll move forward fast. And plus there's a thing called he- keystone habits. Keystone habits are habits where you, do, you have one habit and it influences all these other habits. An example is people that work out in the morning tend to improve their nutrition throughout the day. You know, so those are really, really, really good ones. Number three, play the long game. Does it matter if you're leaner in eight weeks, if in 16 weeks you're back to where you were or even worse? Does it matter that if you're you know, looking great in four months, but for the next three years you're out of shape, right? Play the long game. Let's continue to improve and never look back. That's, that's what we do at Vigor Ground. We help people change for good, right? We're not a place that, hey, listen, we can get you really fast results which we, we can and we've done that in the past, but our focus is people that are tired of gaining weight, losing weight, but really just wanna change for good forever. That's who they become. Keep it simple. Like if you're overwhelmed and stressed and like it's taking over your life to where your life becomes sucking because of the changes you wanna make in your transformation, then it's really kinda, the, your, your whole point is to feel better, feel more confident, feel more powerful. So if the plan is actually getting you away from the key, like the, the key feelings that you wanna have. It's not an effective plan, let's keep it simple. And number five, like start at the beginning, right? You either start, for everybody's gonna be different. Low hanging fruit, go for the easy win, or let's take a big chunk of the big kahuna, right? That's what we do individually and that's a question for you. And like I said, we talked about that a little bit in the, in the, in the magic question uh, beyond that. You can see how like the last one is like, why is fitness failing you? Which is, which is the intro to the next presentation that you'll see in another day. But with that said, we're gonna have a second part to this uh, where we're gonna do examples and whiteboard this. But this is the baseline philosophy and approach that we take when it comes to nutrition. All right now, obviously, there, we could go down a rabbit hole every, every single one of those, um, but here's the kicker. Like we said, number four in that one, you know, one, two, three, four, five was keeping it simple. I promise you, we've had people get massive results with simple things and they, they're blown away by, man, I never thought it could be this simple. Now, simple doesn't mean easy. There's still changes to be made. It's still a ch- you know, challenge. You're still shifting your life and changing your life. But nonetheless, right, well, the goal is not to be massively overwhelmed or that it completely rips your life apart, you know, eating out of Tupperware, you know, six times a day, not thinking about anything else but your nutrition and, you know, your life stops, this, that, and the other, Okay. So once again, like there's an individual approach for you. Hopefully these philosophies and principles that we go by are going to help you out uh, apply to your own nutrition. But as always, like we're here for you. If you want to have a strategy slash transformation session with us, just to go like where you are right now, what's your point A, what's your point B, and guide you in, um, in kind of creating a blueprint for you. And if from there on, a lot of people decide to stay with us and, act, and transform for good. Uh, and if not, you got a lot out, out of value out of it. Either way, it's a win-win situation. Appreciate you listening into this, but make sure you apply it because if you don't apply it, it doesn't matter, right? Information has to go to integration and then integration turns into transformation. Just information by itself is worthless. See you at Vigor Ground, my friends.